we're going to talk about this Greenpeace business and really to talk about how they operate. It is often said that, you know, if you want to go to a gunfight, please don't bring stick and knife, okay? So it is, it is something of a serious nature that we wanted to find out their strategy. What are they doing, essentially? And then I'm going to talk about rather embarrassing stuff about these plastics. I mean, this is really becoming out of control in a lot of sense that you read it almost every day. As you can imagine, yesterday, President Trump jumped on that topic. It's 50th, uh, 50th anniversary, so we're going to take a good look at this planet with the moon passing by. It's taken from a very prestige uh, uh, position at Lagrangian Point, L1 Point. It's about a million miles from, uh, from us. And it is often say, Greenpeace say on this climate change issue, there's no more debate allowed. And then Al Gore, of course, will add his own flavor, which is always say that, you know, those skeptics, you know, all you skeptics, you don't believe in that in climate change. So you are a bit like those guys who believe that the moon landing was staged, right? In fact, there's even scientific paper published on those issues, as you can see, by some of these really smart people from Australia. And uh, here, I simply wanted to take the advantage because uh, many years ago, uh, uh, Art Robinson, Noah, and David Legates, and myself, and Craig Itzel happened to be able to write a little letter to, to one of the newspaper in one of the university in Utah that uh, we indeed wanted to tell them, you know, one of us, Harrison Smith, actually stood on the moon, drilled the hole, collect the moon rocks, has seen returned to the Earth. So we know that the landing is real. <laughs> this is a very nice shot of uh, Harrison in 1972, of course, looking back at this beautiful blue planet that Greenpeace, no one is trying to destroy except you. And so my question is really for Greenpeace is very simple. By the way, I do dedicate my talk to Greenpeace. Hopefully that they'll be more green and more peaceful. <coughs> and indeed, I want to ask Greenpeace, when will you apologize for all the mistakes and all the errors and all the sins that you have committed? This is one of the famous stories that the uh, New York Times actually retracted in uh, the day where Apollo 11 was launched, July 17, 1969. Because back in 1920s, they were publishing in a newspaper attacking Professor Robert Goddard, the father of rocketry, who claimed that he needed to go back to high school because he didn't understand all this stuff about Newton's law would, wouldn't work in a vacuum. So they finally admitted their mistakes, which is a very good thing because always there's always a way to try to correct yourself when you're wrong. So a challenge for Greenpeace, please try to land somebody on the sun. <laughs> go there at night. So Greenpeace, it's a bit of a phenomenon, right? It's always looked like something that is quite weird, that the line is not straight. By the way, it is straight. It's a visual, visual effects. It's not quite what it is, actually. It turns out that Greenpeace is actually a very big and profitable business. And by the way, the, most of the credit of this report has to go to Michael Connolly because he's the guy who dug out all the details, which is really good at hiding, by the way. So, but we are very good at finding also. So tell Greenpeace to keep hiding. Anyway. So it's based on this report. I'm very glad that all of us are here. And then, of course, Dr. Patrick Moore, which is you all know that he's going to speak tonight. And uh, we are so happy that actually he was uh, willing to work with us on this report. So it's very good. It added a lot of credibility, by the way. None of us are Greenpeace members, so I apologize. The first thing you need to know is Greenpeace is really has a lot of money. We are really talking about operations of the order of, you see, as you can see, 386 million, okay? We're not little baby stuff, it's not any grassroots movement, it has nothing to do with any of that. It is a very top-down, control, control, control kind of a situation. If you think that Greenpeace is run by a bunch of these, uh, you know, people who really want to save the earth and all those people, no, 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 it's run by five or seven guys actually at the top, who actually keep reappointing themselves, obviously, and then they run the whole show, essentially. And then if you turn, think in terms of their assets, these are non-profit, but of course, their, their assets keep accumulating. As you can see, the number reached about $280 million, and two-thirds of that is in cash. So these guys are very, very good businessmen in a lot of ways. So we ought to learn something about Greenpeace, about how to make business. So Greenpeace has been a lot of this sort of, they study all sorts of issues. One of the issues they study, obviously, is global warming, right? It's been a very, very long time already, but they, as you can see, this is the way they do this business, right? The very first step is you got to invent some kind of problem, right? If there's no problem, there's nothing to be solved, okay? And you also have to have a solution, obviously, because if there's no solution, I mean, who wants to give you money, right? For just uh, crying about a problem. And obviously, they also pick enemies. 
I am unfortunately one of the small little guy who got picked also, so <laughs> it's well known that I, I've been a, a target of Greenpeace for a while. And then one of the unfortunate ones was all this oil company named uh, ExxonMobil, which is also very unfortunate, got picked. And of course, they, they, they kind of uh, don't pick other oil companies like Shell or BP and all those things. And then, they clearly, another step that is very obvious in these people's operation, it really has nothing to do with facts or evidence, actually. If anything gets better, they will be very upset, by the way. If the planet turns greener, they will be even more upset, actually, because it's just too green for them. And uh, they will dismiss any solution that, that people are trying to do, or however foolish it is, but people try, they will just say, oh, this is not adequate, this is wrong, this is all wrong. Like, the most recent one was actually somebody from Switzerland published a paper saying that, oh, perhaps uh, there are a lot more area to plant trees. And therefore, it can suck down a lot of CO2 in some sense. Oh, they got really, really angry actually on those things. So they sent out the hit squad and all these academicians started to write paper back and forth and all that stuff. <laughs> so the purpose of Greenpeace is actually to jump from one alarm to another. You can see, this is actually a chart from 1994 to 2015, charting basically what they are doing. Their main area is actually the climate, forest and ocean. Together, these three subjects covers almost like a billion dollars of a, of a business in some sense. Nuclear, as you can see, was right there in the beginning and then completely disappeared because there's no more nuclear, no more uh, world is at peace, finally. Uh, in terms of that, what do they spend money on? It's mostly on media, obviously. right? And we're really talking about serious money, by the way. I really hope you think that $34 million is a small peanut. It's actually a huge amount of money for folks like us. We'll probably be able to support ourselves for the rest of our life <coughs> to do a lot of good work. One of the clear things is that the, their spending on nuclear has been gone, right? It's really gone by 2005, 2010. There's absolutely no more, no more, no more spending on this business. So they closed down that campaign, and then they start new one, of course. They obviously have to find new one. And then on uh, biodiversity, that also kind of didn't sell as well. So in the beginning, they were very enthusiastic for a short term, like a few years, and then, oh, by 1997, it's all gone. Then they start something called the genetic modified food. This is the people that really create even more scares. I believe that Patrick Moore is involved in some of those things on golden rice and so on and so forth. But that also actually not sell very well. So by 2010, close down. Spend no more money. Just a little quick thing about what Greenpeace has done, the kind of uh, credit that one ought to assign to uh, Greenpeace for their really outrageous stuff. Here is one statement from a former Greenpeace member who actually was really, really believed in, in Greenpeace kind of a cause and so on and so forth. He said that he came back from a conference, right, with suitcase of paper and he studied this sort of stuff. He just said that, you know, it's not possible to try to say that this GM food is any dangerous, right? A bad for human health, it's just not true. And then when he told Greenpeace, Guess what they tell him, right? Oh, they, we will continue to make that claim because if people are in fear over their health and the health of their children, they will open their, open their wallet for donation. Everything else they say is just not suitable for the kind of campaign they're going. So for the sacrifice of campaign, we're going to do everything we can. And then the two next popular subject is actually on forests, of course, and, and oceans. You can see the number is pretty substantial. By 2015, they started to declare that they see the opportunities coming. So the plastic campaign essentially started around 2015. And we will talk a lot more about the plastic issue, whether it really is a serious problem or not. And here is just a way to look at all the numbers because it's really hard to find the numbers, but I don't think you need to read that. But together, climate, oceans and forests is over a billion dollars. Boy, this is a lot of money these people are spending. And then on the climate itself, you can see it's kind of uh, on the 10 million levels from 94 to about 2004, and then boom, they spend a lot more. By the time you reach uh, 2014, you actually spend almost like $49 million or $48 million. That's quite a lot of money. But together, the total amount that they spend since 1994 is $521 million. That's half a billion dollars of, of cash and money that these people are spending. Incredible, actually. No wonder, right, Joe? We are very proud that we can beat them, actually, by a very little amount of money. And then now, for context, what does that mean, all that money? Actually, mean, uh, it means that it's a lot of money they have. You, if you think about the number that uh, ExxonMobil, so-called ExxonMobil, has been funding all these uh, deniers and everything, 
And this number, by the way, is even more cute, is that uh, Michael got it from Greenpeace source itself. So they're actually tabulating how much uh, Greenpeace has been, uh, uh, Exxon has been giving money to, to people. I actually received some funding from them, of course, from research, about $50,000 a year sometime. And it's only $1.8 million a year. How can you fight this thing? It's really indeed that you didn't even bring a rock to the, to the gunfight, so it's just not going to happen. So indeed, Greenpeace, really, that we have to really show that how dark they are, really. They are the, among the, you know, I don't want to demonize Greenpeace too much, maybe just a little bit, but it's just too much. This group is just not for anything. Essentially, it boils down to this. It's anti-science, anti-human, anti-nature, anti-everything. I don't know how many more anti's you can have. I run out of fingers, so that's a problem. This is another very cute visual trick because uh, I don't know if any of you can see the ball is actually moving or the thing is rotating. Greenpeace is a bit of that kind of phenomenon, right? Everything is a visual deception. What they say is just not what it means. So they are very, very good at creating fake news and uh, I would say blackballing and blackmailing uh, industry, obviously. But you can ask a very simple question. What is Greenpeace most afraid of? What do you think, guys? Oh, no, 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 no. Two words. Patrick Moore. <laughs> Patrick Moore got very, very famous the other day. He's already famous anyway. And then pres he got on Fox News and then uh, President Trump quoted this by just simply saying, excuse me, guys, CO2 is plant food. <laughs> I mean, can you believe those things that we have to argue all over the place? And we need a President Trump to stand up. And, and of course, thanks, uh, Patrick Moore, for really being able to make it so clear to the, you know, the layman to be able to understand very well. So I think this is something that we can be very proud of because we are part of this movement. And as you can see, as soon as the news came out, if you look at the top panel, in February of 2015, obviously Patrick Moore is one of them, right? If you Google, this is actually one of those uh, media censorship now is coming along. And then by 2019, you will see Patrick Moore has gone fishing, so apologize. And here's where Patrick Moore is. He's under the P. You guys can see him, right? He's kind of a very nice young guy and uh, enthusiastic, really, really doing the right thing at the right time. Unfortunately, Greenpeace make him disappear. <laughs> so, that's pretty weird. It tells you that beware, man. You can do a lot of this uh, image processing. <laughs> this is a very dangerous future that we're dealing with now. And Greenpeace, of course, Patrick Moore is there, right? So they cannot change history like that. They cannot disown him. Tonight, he's going to tell a lot more stories about stuff that he got involved with. But I wanted to say that Patrick Moore is somebody that I admire. I'm very glad to have opportunities to know him. He's what I call a true environmentalist and conservationist. He make no apology on it. And I think this statement captured the essence of this plastic problem pretty well. When people are shouting that, oh, CO2 is not dirty, but bottle and cans are all beaches are, they say, no, bottle can be not dirty too in that sense, because especially when being washed by the sea. Because when he's on Greenpeace, he will throw this empty because it's going to turn into habitats and home for the species, okay? Think, think for yourself. So here's what Greenpeace is doing, right? Extorting is basically as extortion business, right, really, in some sense. So up to the latest scare, of course, on, on campaign and the, the plastic use, users. So the first thing they do is they pick the biggest name you can find, Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, you know, what have you, right? Stop plastics. And then Coca-Cola is one of their favorite target, obviously. So these people got to pay up, boy. Nestle, Nestle going to be attacked, of course. And uh, Nestle, of course, single use, all these, all these languages that they actually rob us, and uh, we don't have to play along with them. And then uh, on issues of uh, new Oreos, uh, they are fighting, okay, issues of deforestation, but they encourage biomass. Uh, that's kind of weird uh, contradiction. And then when it comes down to some industry group, this is actually a Norwegian oil company, the biggest one, trying to help some of this deforestation stuff, wanted to help planting the, the forest. And uh, they are not very happy about this. So they are against this one again, against this anti-solution either. So the many sins of this is that they are anti-science, anti-energy, anti-people anti and anti-everything, right? So it's a very, very serious problem. You all may know that uh, Greenpeace is among the earliest person, as soon as uh, President Trump was elected, by January 24, you can see they already started this resist movement, right? The banner, right behind. Uh, this is what they are. I don't know if they're, you know, they're really American company or not. But anyway, 
Look at them. They've been all over the place trying to create trouble in some sense. And, but the thing that they do, this is part of the stuff. When it's people, war heritage, this is actually one of the famous war heritage sites in Peru. And they will start, go do things like this. Destroy all this natural thing. And need not apologize for it. You know, they don't have to say they are wrong and then essentially should chop up their hand in some sense. My God, these people, they really left stuff that is very, very hard to, 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 to clean up in some sense. Creating all kinds of trouble and don't have to own up to it. And I ask you, what's wrong with this picture? We can't use fossil fuel, we can't do all this thing, and then now we just have to create a group of people who know how to knit, knit clothing, right? People have no money, people are cold, people need food, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, Greenpeace, of course, they go speculate in the markets. When they lost those money, they have nobody to be accounted for, right? So this is one of the examples of the kind of stuff they do. You know, speculating on markets, you know, exchange, so make a little more money for themselves. I don't know what they're trying to do with all their money. <coughs> Should donate to all of us. Anyway, what is the latest scare you think that came, uh, Greenpeace is campaigning on now, right? I already hinted to you. It's clear. It's plastics. This is one of the biggest ones coming along, I tell you. Glo I'm sorry about global warming now. Oh, God, you really need to find a new job. I mean, this plastic, man, is really went completely berserk in a lot of sense, right? I mean, if you look seriously, I mean, this is really serious. Everywhere now you have all the city government, all the stuff is proposing this, banning this, banning that, banning this, banning that. I don't know what to do with these people. But I'm going to keep using this, of course. This is what President Trump group uh, sent out yesterday. <laughs> he, he's just trying to create trouble. He's telling them the resistance is here. So indeed, there is a breaking news, right? The, the border war has been solved, the problem. And then this one is not to laugh about, but I have to tell you the alternative for this plastic straw, instead of the paper one who's going to put paper on your mouth, is basically this so-called metal straw. There are actually person killed by these things, this, this, this metal straw. And I have to tell you, I really cannot afford, if you think about the metal straw, think about how much it costs. It's almost uh, $70 for those, uh, however many of these things. And I don't know, maybe there will be a lot of germs after a while you drink some juice and all that. I don't know what to, how to do with this. I don't think the cleaning will be very good. What about all these other side effects? I mean, very cute photo, you know, throwing a bunch of plastics and then uh, swimming like this. They're trying to say synchronized swimming under all this, all this plastic waste. What an idiot, these people. And then you can see this kind of stuff. It's absolute lie, by the way. They show a picture like this. This one turned out to be Manila Harbor. It's the Philippine people. They're very poor. <laughs> they have no ability to even clean up, so they throw all their trash. This is the trash and waste management problem from day zero. Right? All you need is landfill and maybe some certain important product, incineration. You know? And that's about it. And they're against every single one of these things, obviously. You can, you can burn, you can throw this landfill, and so on and so forth. There's never a, a fundamental problem in all these things. And this one is even worse. This one is trying to make it look so scary. This has actually happened after an earthquake of, in Japan, Tohoku earthquake 2011. And they would put up pictures like this, trying to deceive people. I mean, upon some tragedy that is happening. Oh, that's just too much to take, by the way. And then I stole one slide of this uh, from uh, uh, Patrick Moore, who always says that uh, there is this uh, great Pacific garbage patch, right? It's, it is actually an advertisement ploy. Please raise your hand if you believe there's actually such a garbage patch somewhere in the Pacific. Oh, big Pacific. Oh, this guy believe. Good for you, Paul. <laughs> and then we got the great saint. There's a young little kid now, 16 years old, called Greta Thunberg from Sweden. She actually can see a lot of this sort of thing, by the way. She, can, she was claimed to be able to see CO2, by the way. Uh, but the things that she's actually copying is actually based on a scientific paper. Can you believe that? She is so fluent in science that she quickly got the news from uh, this new paper saying that, you know, the plastic is not only on the ocean, it's actually deep inside, a thousand feet down. We are really in a lot of trouble and there's a lot of scientists say this, scientists say that, oh, these are the problem. And of course, first of all, to, to make sure, make sure we take a picture, satellite picture. By the way, it should be more cloudy, so you reduce some cloud, you show there's actually nothing there. What are they talking about? Right? And then we have another young kid. I call him a celebrity, by the way. But this kid means well in some sense. He's really trying to, to clean the ocean, by the way. So I, I think he should find a good job for that one. He actually was trying to tell Greta, you know, this 
this this stuff you got to be careful. That paper, you know, just just reported the counts, which means you take a plastic, you shred it into nano size and spray over the ocean. What does that mean, right? We have to count the mass. So she was just trying to give uh, Greta a little lesson. Boy, immediately after she said that, you will see that this this boy and slide got attacked very heavily, very very quickly. This is a very common reaction actually, and actually. I didn't want to do this, so I, 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 but I'm not lazy, by the way. One thing that I am is not lazy, never ever lazy. So I look it up, look at the paper. And they're basically having these towing units from Montre, you know, the California Montre, whatever, the marine uh, sanctuary place. They were towing this stuff, doing this kind of stuff, showing the measurements. This is where the word that you really need science for this. I mean, they're measuring stuff, whatever, the, the black curve with this, uh, you know, this uh, blue areas. And it turns out that those things are detecting something called some particle, plastic-sized particles. Well, small, micro. They're talking micro, right? Well, it's some like 10, 10, 100, I don't know, per, per cubic meter. And just to tell you that really, really, a cubic meter of, is the size of that size. I mean, they really think that this is going to be dangerous, huh? This is absolutely scientism and nonsense, actually. Whoever they're going to be afraid of this, I really think that you need mental health kind of thing. Uh, by the way, I'm offering a service for that too. <laughs> $200 an hour. <laughs> this guy, Boyan Slat, is a very, very smart kid. He quit his school and decided that he's going to dedicate his life to clean the ocean. So, but actually, he's quite a celebrity. But I tell you, there's still something wrong with this approach. He attempted. Poor guy attempted. And uh, by, by January of uh, this year, they actually tried to uh, uh, put out this system that they, they invented, so-called. By the way, it's an old invention. Somebody already tried about 10, 30 years ago. And uh, they tried to do that and didn't work, okay? And then, yeah, she admitted. No, no, this, he admitted this problem, and then uh, they are now trying to redeploy. As of yesterday, I checked their system. They are still testing now. Now they realize that they need a lot more testing. So I wish him well if you really want to clean the ocean. You know, keep, go, keep going. Just don't spend my money. That's it. And uh, this, is, this is the kind of quote, right, from some expert people who really also care about the ocean that this... This, they are really were rushing. They think that there's some kind of super duper young star kid that is 24 years old can invent a whole system. All you old guys don't know nothing. And I'm going to try to clean the ocean for you. And of course, they, you, by the way, the cleaning of ocean stuff make Greenpeace very angry, okay? You know why, right? Because they say that you can continue to pollute. That's basically they want to have zero plastic. You've got to not have plastic use anymore. So it's very clear that they were too ambitious and they really don't know what they are doing. You know, this kid, man, got to calm down a little bit in some sense. But I don't blame him, he can try, you know. But here, here, exactly, if you talk about solution, does Greenpeace really like it? This, this is one sp spokesperson uh, from uh, Greenpeace Ocean Campaign, clearly saying that, you, you, oh, you, if you put out this system, you're going to harm the small marine animals. So really, really be careful. But who is dumping all the plastic in the ocean, in the world ocean? Here's a very straight answer. China, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Egypt, Malaysia, Nigeria, Bangladesh. It's basically Asia and African country. What is the main reason? It's actually not having enough money. Don't have a proper management, waste management system. I mean, we can help them, you know? And if you count numbers, I mean, US is 0.9%, EU themselves 1%. Cut all the plastic you want to <laughs> stop using, ain't gonna do nothing to this so-called stuff that is going from river areas and to the, into the oceans. I mean, it's just not going to happen. That's how ridiculous it is. But of course, it's never about the numbers. It doesn't mean anything for them. And uh, well, President Trump, by the way, the other day I remarked on this issue also because he probably heard enough of this issue that he did say that, you know, as you can see, it's a big problem, he said. Thousands and thousands. So he really don't have good advisor in this sense. So in some sense, we really need to also let him know that this is not a very serious problem. We qu qu quickly could solve this thing. Any entrepreneur could easily do this kind of thing, probably. So there's thousands and thousands of garbage come, from, come to us. Well, he's saying about garbage coming to us, so we've got to be careful. But I was very upset when I looked into the uh, president's uh, ocean, uh, uh, well, we call Office of Science and Technology and Policy. They actually issued a report on the, on the ocean, and they actually got caught into this plastic nonsense, too. They're talking about these so-called microplastics, right? It's going to harm this, harm that. By the way, I'm, I'm open-minded on this issue. I look into all of this. By now, you obviously know what my answer is, right? I really studied this thing for quite a few months now, almost a year now, to look into these things. Just no such problem, actually.
I'll explain in a minute. I'll show you some data. So, but they really forgot. We really need plastics, you know. We're using it for really the most convenient things that we could have. So we do have to remind them there are so many unintended consequences that they're trying to propose, right? And those are no using plastic. Here's one good, uh, good group from Ghana, West Africa. The minister is saying that this plastic waste for them is a resource, can be utilized to generate employment, he said, right? It will be up to $100 million if they get this thing going, right? So it's good in that sense that you have a bit of a resistance. And then even academics, some serious academics who actually don't buy into all this nonsense, they do a proper uh, estimates of things. If you ban plastics, what kind of consequence could you have? It's essentially doubling of energy com consumption, tripling of uh, greenhouse gas emission, and quadrupling the environmental costs. I don't know Greenpeace care about those things or not, by the way. So just to give you some facts, right? It turns out to be like that. And thank God for our constitution, at least uh, federalism would still work. Individual state can try to do something. This is the state of New Hampshire. The House actually passed this plastic ban, but then the Senate actually stopped them. So at least one state doing something. The rest of it, I hope you keep fighting, you know. Texas, Arizona, please. Don't let them win this one. And then science, you can always do science, by the way. So immediately there are people already study this sort of thing and trying to find out a better way to make plastics that actually will be fully recyclable in that sense. Obviously that you can do all of these things using any number of tricks, just to show you this cute paper that just came out in Nature Chemistry. I mean, this chemistry, by the way, is not my level of chemistry, too difficult for me, but uh, just to tell you that it can be done. You know, the, the way they show you how easy it is to get this plastic remelted and get back the monomers and things like that. So it's really, really that, but the problem is still always about the cost, right? In some sense, but it can be done. But really, how big is the plastic issue by now, right? It's very, very serious, by the way. From, from Boston, you can always see this sort of thing, right? They're covering uh, all this stuff from uh, thing to plastic. Boston is terrible. And then even Al-Qaeda now is banning plastic. <laughs> you laugh, but they're not banning. Some, somebody very clever said they're not banning bombing, assassination, and target civilians, right? But they will ban plastic bags. Ah, thank God for Greenpeace, you know? You at least stop the Al-Qaeda from doing something. So I congratulate them for a very successful marketing campaign. It's very, very successful in that sense. Okay, da, if you hear this, don't be fooled by Greenpeace. Pick a fight. Oh, it's a big issue, National Geographic. Take a little plastic, take a nice uh, picture. All oh, this picture, I don't believe it all look very unreal. It's completely Photoshop, by the way, okay? You really think that plastic gonna float like that for you to take picture? Just beware, you know, the, what you see is just not what you get. And then, of course, this plastic waste is costing $2.5 trillion a year, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, it's getting more and more money. Oh, and then uh, another very famous uh, scientism uh, kind of a leader by the name of uh, David Attenborough. He's well respected, of course. Done a lot of good work in the past, but of, unfortunately, I think he's gone insane in some sense. So they start talking about plastic killing 1 million people. I mean, these are the usual thing. You all been to a lot of our talk on uh, PM 2.5 and all that. All this, they're all imaginary death, by the way. There's just no death certificate and no such thing. Nobody died of all those things, you know. And, you know, they die of poverty from other kind of a problem. Unfortunately, he's a very popular person. I think 2017, he has one of these Blue Planet 2 kind of film that watched by 20% of the UK residents, you know. And 80 million people in China watch it. So... He cannot have his own sway, but they are creating all sorts of lies, actually. There's no such thing. But the, I told you, the problem is actually have nothing to do with plastic, really. It's about them against landfill and waste incineration, right? And then they want plastic recycling. That's another one of the big, big problem. The idea of recycling is really, really very, very misguided in a very strong sense. And here's the problem of uh, recycling, right? We actually, I have to say, today, I think we have some sort of a recycling crisis. Very serious problem. Everybody thought that they are doing better by recycling, washing their stuff. It's just any tiny amount of contaminants. And you hear now, many, many of these places from Africa, from Asia, Philippines, from Cambodia, they're sending all the ships that going from US tanker and then bring it back, right? You just can't do nothing. And now you see how much it costs now? Used to be that you at least can make a little money from those things. Now it costs, 120, you have to pay them money to do this stuff. 
And I like this quote from uh, our Canadian friend, Donald Lafambois, who said that, you know, really, really, recycling is really wasting your time and your own money. It's just something that is not, not even worth doing in a lot of sense. And uh, here's one of those uh, so-called artists. This is a famous artist by the name of Chris Jordan. I put this up because he's very famous. His pictures are everywhere. One of these pictures is basically, he claimed to went to Pacific I Island somewhere, take a picture, and he saw a bird like this. Actually, I kind of doubt myself about this picture, actually. The, the, the stuff uh, look pretty much arranged. That actually, if you look carefully, I think Michael found one of the videos showing that they were actually arranging stuff to look it a little better because he's an artist. What can you do, right? And uh, by the way, you see the evolution of this picture. When you see in normal places, okay, and they say this is from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service headquarters, right? They show this picture. In that sense, they put that all oh, filled with plastic. On Greenpeace webpage, they want to make sure that this is unaltered stomach content. They are so worried about this thing being a stage uh, issue, right? It shows you, well, we have Patrick Moore to help us. Unfortunately, a lot of seabird, a lot of this seabird, even though they are swallowing plastic, they are not being harmed by it in some sense. But as you all know, they got no teeth, right? They got no teeth, right? They actually had to swallow a lot of that. Even the mother feed uh, these little chicks a lot of these particles from actually pumice, you know, from uh, larvas and all those other stuff, so that they actually can grind their food for digestion. So in that sense, I don't know. They don't. They seem to be not serious about all of this. But it was known long time ago, you have seen pictures like this from 1960-something, or 66 on this one. And it didn't harm the albatross that they were claiming to be harming. Here, although the data are very scanty, but if you look at the points that we got, this is also compiled by uh, uh, Michael and uh, Ronan Connolly. I mean, there just seems to be not a big issue. How many, how many, instead of, uh, pl isn't the plastics and all those bad things supposed to kill the albatross, right? But the number keep increasing. Oh, you know, more marketing scare. Here's one of those pictures. This one, I, I watched the whole video. It's very painful to watch this uh, unfortunate turtle has one of these plastic stuck into his nose. And uh, they were trying to make a big fuss out of it. By the way, this one is up to, I don't know, 50 million view now. And then Greenpeace think they're very clever. This look like a Photoshop. If they actually do that to some kind of turtle, I really punch them myself. You know what I mean? They think they're very clever to do this. Of course, give some money. And then they put that to bird, they do this kind of stuff. Really think that they're very clever, you know, to sell this. There's a series of this thing. This is what I mean by campaign, right? Because you have a cause here, you got to show this campaign business. And then, oh, this one, I kind of don't believe it. They seem to say that this is a real photo. That's kind of cute, right? This, this, and uh, the tip, by the way, if it's on the ocean, I don't think it looks a bit too new to me, you know? I don't know what you think, actually, I have no opinion. I just felt like this is a completely another stage stuff. They claim it's real, by the way. Oh, it's just non-stop, this kind of charades, right? But the question is, is the microplastic, they are really talking about plastic in small sizes, okay? Are they really harming the fish? And now I want to tell a story about this, this young lady by the name of Una Lonstedt and her, her professor, Peter L. Eckloff, okay? They published a paper in Science in June of 2016. And this is the paper. Don't need to read it. Essentially, it says that they've tried to feed, do an experiment. They feed this, this fish, uh, larva, baby, eat uh, all microplastics, so they eat. And uh, they feed them, some of them control with no feeding. So they, they found out that, oh, this microplastic is harming, harming the, the, bird grow, uh, the, the fish growth and, and even hurt the earrings, okay? The hearing, so they will be more vulnerable to attack by the, the, the other fish that will want to eat them or something, right? So it's triple threat, right? It's causing the hearing ailment, so I can't hear no more, and this kind of thing. Yeah. It's so sad. They have picture. Washington Post immediately jump on it. All the tiny little dot in the fish larvae was supposed to be the, the thing that they feed to the, the tiny fish. And then BBC, obviously. BBC cannot be behind Washington Post, obviously. So all this dot, 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 those guys are eating those things. It's causing terrible damage. And then they even have plots saying that if you look at that, the control and the average one, the proportion surviving, you can see. Control and average, they are kind of okay, they still die, but uh, the high one, in 12 hours, those guys are supposed to be dead, okay? And then blah, 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 the length becomes shorter if you eat a lot of these microplastics. And uh, number of ingested particles, that one we see, the high one is high one, the average, and then you show picture. 
Oh, but is the microplastic really caused the decline of all these fish perch and pike over, pike over the Baltic Sea for the past two decades? <laughs> Sorry for the bad news. That was just a hoax. <laughs> it was a complete hoax. It turns out that this young lady didn't even do this experiment. She made it all up. <laughs> Unbelievable, you know. We went through the whole charade. I mean, when they asked for data, she said, space aliens stole my computer. No more data. <laughs> Holy cow, you have to put a face to this kind of people. They are very kind people, isn't it? Right? And then this, this uh, I, would, I would also put blame on this, this advisor. She did a postdoc with this guy. And this guy now claimed that, oh, I didn't do anything. She did it all. But why you sign your name on this paper? Right? He, he really cannot run away. So when they ask him question, during the preliminary investigation last year, you said you have repeated the microplastic study on other fish species with similar results. Will those data be published? Oh, no, 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 no. Those are the UNA study. I, didn't, I have not been involved. And then you are no longer doing research on that. Oh, I have never done research on microplastic. I probably will never do research on microplastic. How irresponsible all this punk are, you know, essentially. All the people's goodwill and they kind of tell lie, pull a fast one on us. This is the kind of uh, psychosis that is in trouble now. By the way, this, this lady got a PhD from, uh, from uh, James Cook University, the famous university where our friend Peter Reed are uh, being being kicked out from the university, right? Today, the news just announced that the university lost all the lawsuit. Every single count they lost. They spent about $650,000 of uh, taxpayer money and they won't admit their mistake, so they want to repeal again the process. Unbelievable, this sort of nonsense, you know, on, on the issues of Peter Reed. Professor Peter Reed from uh, James Cook University. And you see, I put the quote there. I mean, there's something wrong with person who actually put a quote like that, quoting Aristotle about being excellent. It's a habit for her. It turns out that her habit is rather bad. I have no mercy on that. You know, this lady really should come clean. So, more unfinished business. I mean, it's just exaggerate the level in all the microplastic exposure study that I look at. Here's one on oyster reproduction. They say, oh, it's affected by this, and of course, they can do experiment, it's going to cause damage. And then here, I'm glad that at least some scientists published a rebuttal. One of those rebuttals say that, you know, it turns out that they feed these uh, oysters up to 10, 100 to 10 million times how, higher than the actual real world exposure. This is the kind of thing that is just pure nonsense. The experiment that you don't need to do, actually. And then UNFAO, this time I'll forgive them. They actually have something good to say also on, on this uh, microplastic in, in, in terms of fishery and aquaculture. They essentially find that the numbers are not big and there's no evidence that it's harming uh, all these fish species. And even if you eat it, the exposure level, if you count it properly, as I told you, they exaggerated the exposure level when they do the experiment by you know, 10 million times. What, what, what are you trying to do actually? So the exposure level is also very small if you estimate it properly. And then even in some paper that just got published, showing that you actually are very, very hard to find this microplastic in some of these fish that they were doing. In one of these study, they found it in one, one tiny spread out of 400 individuals they study. And then if you want to see the plastic, uh, the picture is there, the two dots, okay? Really, we're spending all our money doing all that thing, like nothing better to do in some sense. But is the microplastic harming human? Oh, fish, who cares, you know? It is, okay? CNN tell you, if you drink bottled water, you be you could double your microplastic uh, exposure. New news care. And then, of course, in one of these newspapers in Tennessee, or immediately linked to people in Tennessee. Well, it turns out that there is a paper. Unbelievable. There's actually a paper that found out that, you know, quote, unquote, the microplastic, remember, they are very tiny, micro. That in tap water is very small amount, but in bottled water, probably from the from the industrial processing, the surface, there are 90,000 they count. I'm still not very afraid of the 90,000 versus 4,000 in tap water. So remember now, right? Don't drink, uh, don't drink the, the bottled water. But they forgot the hallmark of science, right? A hallmark of medicine, actually. All things are actually poison, according to Paracelsus. Nothing is without poison. Only the dose permits something not to be poisonous in a lot of sense. And I want to tell you the next poison, which is water, obviously. <laughs> yes, this is actually, I want to introduce the work of uh, Professor Gordon Gribble from Dartmouth. It is suggested by someone, according to Professor Gribble, 
that if you measure anything in one part per quadrillion, which is 10 to the 15 or higher in a, in a thing, you will find just about every compound, including gold, by the way, so you get rich. <laughs> and here's a problem of, uh, of uh, another poison called water, H2O. In one of these things, in one of these so-called pledge week in 2005, some kids actually win the, the competition by drinking six gallons in less than four hours and actually die. And then another competition is that those guys were drinking so much water, one, one girl drank two gallons of water very quickly and then died. It just really, really tells you that, you know, everything can kill you when you, when you do it in the wrong way. Poor kids. Then I want to tell this final story, I'm almost done, on this organohalogen stuff. Basically, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and then astatine is actually much more rare. But it's around, it's radioactive, very small amount. But do you guys know, actually, they're actually naturally occurring plastic, which is the hydrocarbon, and then this organohalogen, CFC included. That, oh, shh, Greenpeace, Greenpeace children want you to know that. So what's plastic? Just to give you, it's just carbon and hydrogen bond, right? And uh, however complexity you want, I will just pick the example of ethane and propene, and you will see that it's been detected in forests, naturally, in large amount. So we've got to stop that, all the forest emission. And then plastic has also been found in Titan. Okay, plastic has been found in Titan. I don't know, Al Gore probably went there a few days ago. And uh, by now, this is the latest paper from uh, Professor Gribble. He already, he is actually the, the quintessential person for documenting all this natural halogen stuff. He found out up to 5,000 of these things that occurred naturally, okay? And these are the list that I'm gonna highlight, including CFC, okay, 11. Do you guys believe that? CFC 11, okay? <laughs> it's, it's not man-made, it's done by nature. Nature is far more clever than us. Metal bromide, metal chloride, as you can see, and all this dichlorophenol stuff. And here's one example. CFC, the famous ozone scare, right? And this is even one guy that is really also a very green guy, this guy. He's trying to say that the example of natural is Hamlet is completely foolish. In fact, one of the replacements of refrigerant uh, supported by Greenpeace was this thing called R600A. Unfortunately, that what they suggested that is purely hydrocarbon. It's actually very flammable and very, very dangerous, by the way. So you rather use CFC than this because it's been known to kill people. Here it is, CFC detected in volcano. Metal chloride, metal bromide has been found in fires, forest fires. Also found in, uh, you know, canola seed oil kind of uh, production. These are all natural in large amount. And you can find stuff that is completely thought to be human-made in ticks. Oh, okay. And then uh, this thing called the flora acetic acid, found in uh, one of those African plants. They are everywhere. So indeed, I, I would claim that Glimpies knew all this, right? We're just joker. We make stuff up. Okay. Almost done. Save some time for my good friend who's going to talk next, uh, the Connollys. But here's basically the four major problems and issues with Greenpeace, in my opinion. They are very, very uh, cash-rich business. They've got numbers up to 400 million, as you can imagine. And 60 or so, two-thirds of their money is in cash. And they actively fight against education, obviously, because when you campaign, you know, you cannot educate people because they will be, become too smart, then they would think. And they spend almost half a billion dollars on, on misleading people on uh, climate change. And they're not interested in all the solution at all, if you have any. So I think I better stop now and then uh, save some time. If you have questions, do ask questions. And after that, we have extra time for my two colleagues from uh, Ireland who's speaking next. So thank you. Well, you'd looked into the, the ocean plastics question, it sounds like, for some time. And so I'm wanting to make sure I understand this detail about the um, the Pacific patch. I looked into this about 10 years ago and interviewed a scientist at the University of Oregon who had actually gotten, I think, an, uh, you know, a, a grant from the National Science Foundation oh, yeah. to take a ship out there, uh, fully expecting, of course, to see a bunch of plastic floating. And what it is, in fact, is a gyre, a current, a sort of, a, a, yes, a, you know, yes. it's a, essentially a place in which things collect. And so what you have, because it's a gyre, is a slightly higher than average amount Correct. of micro particles and nothing else, nothing like what yes. we're told. And that might be the size of Texas, but who cares? That's because that's, you know, that's sort of where stuff is collected. Is that basically right? Yes, yes. I All agree right. with that point, of course, yeah. All right. 
I, I always very much enjoy your presentations every time. Oh, thank I you. I get up way early so I can be here. I have a comment about the, uh, the, uh, the water situation. Okay. I did some calculations myself quite a few years ago. Did you know that the EPA allows an amount of arsenic in a glass, one glass of water that it takes 165,000 cigarettes to produce? So be healthy. Drink eight glasses of water a day and run away from cigarette smoke. Yes, I have looked at a lot of those numbers on mercury. It's an amazing story. I mean, EPA want to control stuff that even there are more of them in a bottle of Coca-Cola in mercury. It's just too much. Those people are gone insane now because they don't know numbers and they still want to regulate, they want to control. The bottom line is always control, control, control. And there seems to be that we are paying money for all of these things. When are we going to kick out all this swamp, right? I mean, the swamp is actually very, very powerful. No wonder Trump's administration still put out all this garbage, actually. Absolute garbage. I mean, these people really think that they are kidding us, huh? Uh, unfortunately, it's really, really hard fight. But we got to keep fighting. If we don't fight, what are we supposed to do, right? Anyway. Hi, David Randall, National Association of Scholars. This is yes. a slightly self-advertising comment. Please. Our journal, Academic Questions, has an article coming out, I think next quarter, on the microplastics. A guy named Ted Held examined Science Magazine's procedures. Not only was the peer review terribly shoddy, they missed all sorts of clear red flags. Crucially, Science Magazine did not follow its own procedures. You're supposed to provide your data to Science Magazine before publication. They never acquired oh, yeah. it of Lonstead, and then somehow, as you say, it got it got stolen by uh -huh. a space alien. Yes, all of a sudden. Thank but you. The, but, but yeah, so Science Magazine is also indeed Na National here. A Association of Scholars, a very very good group led by Peter Wood, and now I met this guy David Randall. We wrote, I wrote one or two articles for them before, and they're a really good group. I love these people. I mean, some, some, they have a lot of beautiful writing, a lot of good stuff there. I agree. The science has been totally robbed by all these gangsters. I mean, they're really bad. I mean, this is a power review system from now on. I mean, it's so sad, actually. I, I mean, we've been through this business for a long time. You know, we're still continuing to publish, but it's always now that kind of business. Yes. There's just no way you can replicate anything because they just simply don't have to write out anything. There's just no control at all. It's the whole thing has been so maddening now. I, I just cannot imagine, actually. I don't know all these people who think that science is going to still function the way they function. It might be, it's never too late, but then we got to keep telling people. I mean, that's just not the way you want to do science. It's seriously very, very ill. <coughs> My name is Carl Langner. I'm uh, retired, let's just put it that way, engineer. But anyway, what drives me nuts is the LNT theory applied to all kinds of problems. Oh, yes, yes. And that let me tell breeze. you just one that uh, uh, is driving me nuts now. We live up in n northern Colorado, and Colorado State uh, got some grants to go measure uh, toxic uh, gases at the, uh, at the fracking wells. They want to shut the fracking wells down. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they found was uh, one, two, or three parts per billion of toluene and benzene. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> they found at least 10 times that much along the whole uh, stretch of uh, freeway uh, because the cars were giving off uh, some of that stuff. Yes, yes. But anyway, uh, they used that then to, to predict how many millions of people would die from those one and two parts <laughs> per billion. <laughs> Yeah. Using that LNT theory. Yeah, you see everywhere you look, right? Everywhere you look, you get that kind of issues now, right? No one is actually serious about their numbers. They seem to be not caring and seem to get away with every single false statement they could possibly make. Ah, another good talk, Willie. Thank you. I had a question for you, though. While I'm sitting here watching you go over with all the microplastics, so the amount of hydrocarbons that go into the ocean through natural seeps is incredible. <laughs> And in fact, on the Don't tell floor, Greenpeace. You have they might want to control yes, that. There are chemosynthetic organisms that, that absolutely feed on it. Um, there are some recent oil spills that I'm aware of where tremendous amounts of hydrocarbons went into the ocean, but it went in in a very, very fine spray, yeah. and the average size of the particle was 20 microns. It mm -hmm. never came to the surface because it was consumed by the living bacteria in the biosphere zones of the oceans. Yeah, yeah. Is there any point at which the chemistry and the size of the particles, it's actually consumed by bacteria? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's so a is, huge is amount a, of literature that I look into okay. now. That they found a huge, huge class of uh, bacteria are doing those, the, the, what you call, quote-unquote, plastic-friendly kind of uh, 
Yeah, there are okay. a lot of uh, studies on those. Unfortunately, I don't have time too much to dig and point that out, that out, but I look into that. Yes, obviously, there are a lot of literature on that already. But I, I think it's enough. I'm, I'm just doing this to try to uh, say that we learn something of a minimal. This is the minimal that we should learn, that we can speak on the issue. And please encourage everybody to be, speak out against this issue, isn't it, right? Anything that you want from here, you just use it. It's pretty standard and very accurate. We do this research very carefully, all the, all the data that we pull out. So, come on, guys.